Um, so my talk's going to be a little bit different because I didn't have one project I was working on. I was working on the Glances database, and I worked on a lot of um, I guess smaller projects related to it. Um, it's just an overview. I'm just going to give a brief introduction, just a little bit about myself and about my thesis work, because I'm almost finished with my master's, which I'm sure most of you guys know. I'm pretty sure I've studied already. Talk a little bit about Glances, because although I know you guys all work in the Galero lab, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the database or if you've ever had to use it. Um, then I'm going to touch on the projects that I've been working on over the summer and finish up with some acknowledgments. So just an introduction a little bit about myself. This picture is taken in Hawaii. As a lot of you know, um, I did my undergraduate there, um, got my bachelor's in botany, and I worked doing um, invasive species control for um, many years in the field. So that is me walking through a field of strawberry guava, which is super invasive, looking for other invasives and completely ignoring that one. Um, where I worked, the committee, we were working on incipient species, so we were trying to get rid of things that were new to the island. Um, and the irony wasn't lost on us that we spent a lot of our time walking through invaded forests looking for other <laughs> invasives. Um, this picture was taken last summer at me in uh, Peru. I hiked the Inca Trail. That was just fun. And this picture was just taken this summer when Rochelle was gracious enough to let me have a week off to go on a kayaking trip um, in the Apostle Island. So I got to actually go out and enjoy the Great Lakes for a little while this summer, which was really great. Um, my thesis is on the effects of invasive Phragmites australis and Typha exoglauca, which is the hybrid of the native and non-native cattail, um, on methane emissions in a southeastern Michigan wetland. Um, that's me with a poster that I presented at the stewardship uh, conference in January, where I won best student poster. Um, and this uh, is a chamber that I actually built with my advisor. It's a clear plexiglass that goes over plants in the field, so you're able to take gas samples over time, and then you can calculate flux um, from that. And I'm actually presenting a talk on this in a couple weeks at the Ecological Society of America conference. So on to the project that I was working on this summer, which is Glances. Don't worry, you're not meant to read this. It's just a snapshot of what the website um, looks, looks like. So there's really three main components. There is database for the 184 um, established uh, aquatic non-indigenous species. There is a range expansion uh, also range expansion category that you can look at, and then there's the watch list, which is 60 plus species that um, aren't currently established in the Great Lakes, but have either a, a high likelihood of being introduced or a high likelihood of becoming established should they um, become introduced. Um, it's pretty easy to use. You, have this, you can go to the search, you can look under the species category or under the genus or under the common name, and you can submit and you'll get a, um, a fact sheet that comes up that allows the users of Glances, um, whether they be scientists or the general public, to gain information about particular species of concern. Um, we use this with the USGS non-indigenous um, non aquatic species database. So we actually, when we're updating and entering in the fact sheets, we do it through, um, through their database. So it's a nice collaboration um, between uh, NOAA and uh, USGS, and it allows for a lot of um, you know, communication across um, agencies. So some of the projects I worked on were updating and editing fact sheets. So this is what it looks like when you're entering it in. Again, you're not meant to read it. This is just to give you an example of what it looks like. Um, and I worked on updating several fact sheets for um, a few different species during my time, um, one being Phragmites australis subspecies Australis. So as I'm sure many of you are aware, there is a bit of controversy on whether or not to include this in the database because there is a native um, strain of Phragmites Australis subspecies Americana, and recently they were separated out, and people aren't always sh sure how to tell the difference. So one of the things that I did was, going back to this slide, I got permission to use this picture on um, the fact sheet that showed the difference between the introduced and the native. And on the actual fact sheet, I entered in a section where it talks about um, characteristic by characteristic how to tell the difference between the native and the non-native 
uh, lineage. So you can look at different things like palm, which is stem, or leaves, or inflorescence to be able to determine if you're looking at the native or the non-native species. I also um, updated the fact sheet for Alopecurus geniculatus. Um, this one was basically one I just picked randomly to, to, as kind of a learning tool. But as you know, when you're um, doing these kinds of um, science, things are being, new studies are being done all the time. New literature is being published all the time. And so these fact sheets quickly get dated and they needed to be updated regularly. So even a species like this, which I just picked randomly, and as you can see by the map, it's not real prolific. I was able to find a lot of new studies and a lot of new information to put into the fact sheet that hadn't been in there before. So they get out of date really fast. And so getting on a uh, cycle where the fact sheets can be updated regularly um, is something that I know uh, Rochelle is working on because when you're looking at 184 established species and 60 something watchlist species that that's a lot to that's a lot to handle. Um, I also am currently working on updating the fact sheet for Comboba Caroliniana um, as well as Shizocotal Gliognathi, <laughs> which I've not I'm sure I just slaughtered that name. Um, that's the Asian tapeworm and it was previously um, known as a uh, Thethric Bethryocephalus, um, and it got a uh, genus name change, and so um, I'm updating that one as well uh, right now. Another thing that I've been working on um, is finding photos. So you've probably seen the poster um, for the 184 established species, and there's a lot of ones that have images missing. We're also working on making a poster for the watch list. So I was um, going online and finding um, pictures of different organisms, contacting the person who took the photograph, requesting um, permission to use it, and then putting the photo into uh, the fact sheet. So these are just a few examples of species that I got permission to use the photo. Polaris rondonacea. Up there, um, you have the Hypania involata, um, Hypanus colorata. Um, in the middle is uh, Dichrogamorus hemiophagus. Uh, I'm sorry, I massacred these Latin names. <laughs> and down here we have the uh, Patrogamorus robustioides. Um, those are just a few. And then I have also some emails out waiting on response for some other ones. Um, a lot of these small crustacean uh, organisms are really difficult to find photos of because they're diff difficult to speciate as well. So a lot of them, when I was looking for them, it would just say dichrogamorous species, and you can't, you, have to, you can't include that. You have to be sure. Um, so I've been doing a lot of um, internet researching, a lot of doing a lot of literature reviews, finding information for updating these fact sheets, and finding these um, images to go onto uh, the database. Uh, another thing I've been working on is a publication, hopefully. Um, so many people uh, worked on uh, this impact assessment of the established uh, species, the 184 established um, aquatic species. So they were looking at their environmental impact, socioeconomic impact, as well as um, possible uh, beneficial effects. And I went through and I picked out the 10 uh, most environmentally and socioeconomically impactful species and was looking for trends, um, basically what these things had in common that make them so um, impactful. The top 10 are probably not going to be a surprise to most of you. Um, it was the quagga mussel and the zebra mussel were the top two most environmental and socioeconomically um, impactful species, um, followed by the alewife and the sea lamprey. It should be noted that the alewife and also another species coming up, the uh, white perch, did also have pretty high beneficial effects. But for this paper, we were looking, I was looking at the um, environmental and the socioeconomic um, impacts. Um, in the paper, I am going to touch on the fact that they do have beneficial impacts as they are um, important fishery fish. I mean, people use them. They bring in um, they bring in money. Um, 
So next we have the round goby and the white perch. Um, then the Eurasian water milfoil and the water chestnut. And lastly, I included these together on purpose because they are not, I guess, what you would think is typical. We have a bacterial disease, and then we also have um, VHS, the viral hemorrhagic septicemic virus, which can be controversial to consider a virus an organism, but for the sake of the impact that it has um, on the Great Lakes Basin and on organisms that live here and native um, organisms that live here, um, we included it uh, for this paper. So some things that I found for environmental um, impacts that were a, were a common trend was that they pretty much all were a threat to the health of native species and were able to outcompete native species for some kind of resource. Um, and they altered predator-prey relationships. Uh, for socioeconomic impacts, I found that they pretty much all damaged economic sectors. They had an impact on tourism or um, recreation. And they were known to decrease um, aesthetic value, so decrease or decrease like property, um, the property rates and property um, costs. So those were the general trends that I found. Um, I'm still working on this paper, so once it's done, I'm sure you guys can read it if you want to know more detail about the specifics on the impacts. But if I were to go into the specific impacts of all 10 organisms, that would be my entire talk. Um, I also worked on uh, editing a technical memo. So again, you're not meant to read this. This is just an example of what it looked like. Now, I don't have a lot of um, slides on this, but I, I can tell you that it definitely took um, a lot of time. It is another example of a good collaboration, though, of, of scientists working together, because a lot of people were involved in writing this. Um, a lot of student help was utilized. Um, and it, so what this technical memo, which is going to be published, um, was looking at is, of these watchlist species, what is the likelihood that they'll be introduced, and what are the main pathways in which they would be introduced, which most of them was ballast water. Um, then if they are introduced, what is the likelihood that they'll become established? And if they become established, then what are the possible economic, um, socioeconomic, environmental, impacts and also beneficial effects. So it's kind of using the same model for the, that that was used for the established species technical memo. Um, so there are 60 plus species and they were written by a lot of different students and so there's different, definitely different writing styles and so what I did was I went through and sort of homogenized it to make it seem like it was written by one person group instead of you know many different voices and making sure that it was all fitting under the NOAA guidelines because, as you know, everybody has a different way of doing references, in-text citations, um, and that sort of stuff. So I made sure that it was all the same. Um, I implemented and in, um, inputted in tables and graphs and just general formatting to make sure that it was all in compliance and looked like every other technical memo that NOAA um, puts out. So this might not seem as interesting because it's not pretty maps, but it definitely, you know, it's also important work and databases like these are really important for communicating with um, the general public as well as as scientists because when I was doing my like literature reviews looking for things to um, update these, um, these uh, fact sheets on other species, I definitely went to, you know, other organizations um, databases and, and use those. So they're good for general citizens and as well as for um, scientists working in the invasive species field. Um, and so keeping them, keeping it updated and getting these these kinds of um, technical memos and papers out there for people to have access to is very important. Um, and as I mentioned, I had was lucky to get some time off to go uh, kayaking. I also took some time off to work on my thesis, so I'm not finished yet. So I have a few more weeks left here. And so what I'm going to be working on is finding more organism photos for posters. Um, I'm finishing and finding, um, finishing up and compiling all the references for the watch list memo because there are a few full um, citations that were missing. I'm finishing that paper on the top 10 most impactful species and then anything else that Rochelle asked me to do that needs to be done in my remaining weeks here. 
Um, with that, acknowledgements, I want to thank everyone at Siler and Galero for a great and educational uh, summer, and a special thanks to Rochelle for being a great mentor. Um, Dr. Ed Rutherford was also one of my mentors, although I dealt mostly with Rochelle. Um, to the friends from the cubicle around me, shout out to Lauren and all the other summer fellows. Um, it's been a lot of fun. And you want to know what's next? I actually just found out that I was offered a position with the Michigan Department of Agriculture and Rural Development as a plant industry field scientist. So I have a official job. Um, and so with that, I'll take any questions. mentioned that it was a little problematic to call a virus an organism. Well, it's controversial, I said. All right. Well, I'm, I'm curious more about what makes a virus invasive uh, as, as opposed to you know, something that just spreads. And yeah. It, I mean, it's included in the, in the 184 species, like I was saying, in the um, aquatic non-indigenous um, species. Um, information system, and it, it when I just was looking just at the numbers because it was a semi-quantitative um, assessment as far as impacts, it came out as one of the top ten, and I just included that because I know from a lot of my uh, classes as as a master student there has always been that big debate of whether or not do you count a virus as a living organism. Some people say yes, some people say no. Um, as far as counting it as invasive, I guess it spreads. I mean, kind of like bacteria spreads, and people could sometimes. So I guess you could ask the same question about the, you know, the BKD as well. Um, but it causes harm to fish and to fisheries and to native um, fish species, um, and so that was why it was included. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.